This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 17. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time. New evidence showing stars are being eaten by black holes a hundred times more often than thought. A stellar bridge discovered connecting two galaxies. And we check out the night skies of March and the importance of the vernal equinox. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has concluded that stars are being ripped apart and consumed by black holes about a hundred times more often than astronomers had previously thought. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, are based on a new survey of galaxy mergers, the process by which galaxies collide to form new larger galaxies. The authors detected a tidal disruption event during a small survey of just 15 colliding galaxies. Tidal disruption events occur when a star passes too close to a black hole and gets caught up in the black hole's gravitational well. The hapless star is then crushed, ripped and torn apart at the subatomic level, forming an accretion disk around the black hole's event horizon. Most of this stellar debris will eventually pass through the event horizon, a point of no return, beyond which it falls forever into the black hole's singularity. Previously, such stellar destruction had only been detected in massive surveys observing many thousands of galaxies. That led astronomers to believe that tidal disruption events were exceptionally rare events, happening maybe only once every 10,000 to 100,000 years per galaxy. One of the study's authors, Dr James Melanie from the University of Sheffield, says the surprising findings show that the rate of tidal disruption events increases dramatically when galaxies collide. You see, galaxy collisions are known to spark major starburst events as the gravitational perturbations caused by the colliding galaxies result in molecular gas and dust clouds in these galaxies collapsing, triggering the birth of new stars. The authors speculate that many of these newborn stars are formed close to the galactic centre, where they can fall into the gravitational well of the supermassive black hole thought to exist in the hearts of most, if not all, galaxies. The supermassive black holes that lurk at the centres of galaxies can be elusive. That's because they don't shine in the conventional sense, because their gravity is so strong nothing, not even light, can escape. Hence the name black hole. However, the release of energy as the star's ripped apart as it moves closer to the black hole generates dramatic outbursts of energy from the tortured star in its death throes. This outburst from the galaxy's nuclei can appear as bright as the billions of stars in a typical galaxy combined. In this way, tidal disruption events can be used to locate otherwise dim black holes, allowing astronomers to study their strong gravity and how they accrete matter. The authors first observed the 15 colliding galaxies in the sample back in 2005 during a previous project. But when they observed the same sample again in 2015, they noticed that one of the galaxies, F01004-2237, appeared strikingly different. That led them to look at data from the Catalina All-Sky Survey, which monitors the brightness of objects in the sky over time. The authors found that the brightness of this galaxy had flared dramatically back in 2010. The particular combination of variability and post-flare spectrum observed in F01004-2237, which is 1.7 billion light-years away, was unlike any known supernova or active galactic nucleus, but very characteristic of a tidal disruption event. Based on these results, the authors expect that tidal disruption events will also become very common in our own Milky Way galaxy when it eventually merges with the neighbouring Andromeda galaxy in about 3.5 to 5 billion years from now. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A bridge of stars has been discovered connecting the large and small Magellanic Clouds, two of the nearest neighbouring galaxies to our own Milky Way. 
The findings reported in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society were made by the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Telescope and show a 43,000 light year long stellar bridge connecting the two dwarf galaxies. The large and small Magellanic Clouds are named in honour of the Portuguese navigator Ferdinand Magellan. He was the first European to sight them during the first circumnavigation of the Earth between 1519 and 1522. The large Magellanic Cloud is about 163,000 light years away. Although it looks like an irregular dwarf galaxy, astronomers classify it as a disrupted barred spiral galaxy. It's about 14,000 light years in diameter and contains some 10 billion times the mass of our Sun. The small Magellanic Cloud is located about 200,000 light years away. It's classified as an irregular dwarf galaxy, about 7,000 light years wide, with about 7 billion times the mass of our Sun. Astronomers speculate that it was once a barred spiral galaxy, but it became disrupted by the gravitational tidal perturbations of the Milky Way and the Large Magellanic Cloud. Often referred to as satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, astronomers now think both dwarfs are travelling too fast to be true satellite galaxies and may instead simply be passing neighbours in our local galactic group. In the new study, the researchers from the University of Cambridge discovered the stellar bridge in galactic stellar census data being developed by the Gaia mission. For the past 15 years now, scientists have been eagerly anticipating the first data from Gaia, the first chunks of which were released three months ago. This data set of unprecedented quality is a catalogue of the positions and brightnesses of a billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy and its surrounding neighbourhood. What Gaia has sent back to Earth is quite unique. The space-based observatory's angular resolution is similar to that of the Hubble Space Telescope. But given its greater field of view, it can cover the entire sky rather than just one small portion of it. In fact, Gaia uses the largest number of pixels to take digital images of the sky for any spaceborne instrument. Better still, the observatory has not one but two telescopes sharing the one-metre focal plane. Unlike typical telescopes, Gaia doesn't just point and stare. It constantly spins around its axis, sweeping the entire sky in less than a month. Because of this, it not only measures the instantaneous properties of stars, but can also track their changes over time. This provides the perfect opportunity to find a variety of objects, for example, stars that pulsate or explode, even if that wasn't what the telescope was primarily designed for. The Cambridge team concentrated on an area around the two Magellanic clouds and then used the Gaia data to pick up pulsating stars known as RR Lyras, which are very old and chemically unevolved. These stars have been around since the earliest days of the Magellanic Cloud's existence. They therefore offer unique insights into the early history of both dwarf galaxies. Studying the large and small Magellanic Clouds has always been difficult because they sprawl over such a large area. But thanks to Gaia's all-sky view, this has become a far simpler task. From Earth, the Magellanic Clouds are easily visible with the unaided eye in southern hemisphere skies. But even though the clouds have been a constant fixture in the heavens, astronomers have only recently had the chance to study them in detail. Whether the clouds fit the conventional theories for galactic formation or not depends crucially on their mass and the time of their first approach to the Milky Way. And thanks to Gaia, the authors found clues that could help answer both these questions. Firstly, the RR Lyra stars detected by Gaia were used to trace the extent of the large Magellanic cloud, finding it as a fuzzy low-luminosity halo stretching as far as 20 degrees from its galactic centre. The dwarf galaxy could only hold on to stars at such large distances if it was substantially larger than previously thought, turtling perhaps as much as a tenth the mass of the Milky Way. An accurate timing of the clouds' arrival around the galaxy is impossible without knowledge of their orbits. Unfortunately, orbits are difficult to measure at large distances, and their motion across the sky is so tiny that it's simply unobservable over a human lifetime. In the absence of an orbit, the authors found the next best thing, a stellar stream. Streams of stars form when a galaxy or star cluster starts to fill the gravitational tidal force of another galaxy or cluster. The tides stretch the galaxy in two directions, both towards and away from the neighbouring galaxy. As a result, on the periphery of the dwarf, two openings form, small regions where the gravitational pull of one galaxy is balanced by the pull of the other. Stars in these regions find it easy to leave one galaxy and enter the other, forming a tidal stellar bridge as they do. Slowly, star after star abandons the smaller galaxy, leaving a luminous trace on the sky and thus revealing the galaxy's orbit. While stellar streams coming off the Magellanic clouds were predicted, they'd never actually previously been observed. Having marked the locations of the Gaia RR Lyra stars on the sky, the authors were surprised to see a narrow bridge-like structure connecting the two Magellanic clouds. 
Astronomers believe that at least part of this bridge is composed of stars stripped from the small Magellanic Cloud by its larger counterpart. And the rest may be large Magellanic Cloud stars ripped from it by our own Milky Way. The authors believe this R.R. Lyra bridge will help them clarify the history of the interaction between the Magellanic Clouds and the Milky Way. One of the study's authors, Dennis Urkel, says astronomers compared the shape and position of the Gaia Stellar Bridge to computer simulations of the Magellanic Clouds as they approach the Milky Way. They found that many of the stars in the bridge appear to have been removed from the small Magellanic Cloud in its most recent interaction with the large Magellanic Cloud some 200 million years ago, when the two dwarf galaxies passed relatively close to each other. Urkel says that as a result of that flyby, not only stars but also hydrogen gas was removed from the small Magellanic Cloud. By measuring the offset between the R.R. Lyra stars and the hydrogen bridges, astronomers were able to put constraints on the density of the gaseous galactic corona. Composed of ionised gas at low density, the hot galactic corona is notoriously difficult to study. Nevertheless, it's been the subject of intense scrutiny because scientists believe it may contain most of the missing baryonic or ordinary matter in a galaxy. Astronomers are trying to determine the location of this missing matter, which makes up the atoms and ions which make up stars, planets, dust and gas. It's thought most or even all of these missing baryons are in the corona. So by measuring the coronal density at large distances, they hope to solve this conundrum. During the previous encounter between the small and large Magellanic clouds, both stars and gas were ripped out of the small cloud, forming a tidal stream. Initially, the gas and stars were moving at the same speed. However, as the clouds approached our own galaxy, the Milky Way's corona exerted a drag force on both of them. The stars, being relatively small and dense, simply punch right through the corona with no change in their speed. However, the more tenuous neutral hydrogen gas slowed down substantially in the corona. By comparing the current location of the stars and gas, taking into account the density of the gas and how long the clouds were spent in the corona, the authors have estimated the density of the corona. Urkel says the estimate shows the corona could make up a significant fraction of the missing baryons, in agreement with previous independent techniques. With the missing baryon problem now seemingly alleviated, the current model of galaxy formation is holding up well to the increased scrutiny possible with Gaia. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, time to take a quick break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Yeah, you know, there are many times when you can't hold a book, but you can listen to one, such as when you're commuting, when you're at the gym, jogging, or walking the dog. And that's when I listen to Audible. It's my audio bookstore. And you know, I love the idea of someone reading to me. And no one offers a greater selection than Audible. In fact, they've got something like 180,000 titles plus to choose from. Audible's great if, like me, you have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Audible means you can learn so much. And right now, Audible has a special deal for space-time listeners. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And they've got so many great books to choose from. All the best sellers, the classics, science fiction, science fact, history, biography, whatever, often from the people who actually wrote them. How about Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, narrated by Bruce Springsteen? Or The Life of Keith Richards, narrated by Johnny Depp, Joe Hurley and Keith Richards himself? No matter what your taste, there are over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for March on Skywatch. And let us start by wishing everyone a happy new year. Well, it would be if this was ancient Mesopotamia or Rome. That's because March was the first month of the new year, going back to the earliest concept of celebrating New Year's Day at the time of the vernal equinox, around 4,000 years ago. The early Roman calendar, which had just 10 months, designated March as the first month of the new year. In fact, that 10-month year is still reflected today, with the names September, or Septum being Latin for seven, October or Octo meaning eight, November or Novem meaning nine, and December or Deci meaning ten. In fact, it wasn't really until the commencement of the Gregorian calendar that January the 1st marked the start of the year. But in the beginning, it was mostly only the Catholic countries that adopted it. 
Protestant nations only gradually moved across, with the British, for example, not adopting the Reformed calendar until 1752. Prior to that date, the British Empire and its American colonies still celebrated the New Year on the 25th of March. And certainly the highlight for the month is the March equinox, which will take place at 2129 Australian Eastern Daylight Time on the evening of March the 20th, that's 1029am Greenwich Mean Time. For our listeners in the Northern Hemisphere, it of course means the start of spring. While for those of us south of the equator, it's the autumnal equinox and the move into autumn. The day marks the point in Earth's orbit around the Sun when the planet's rotational axis means the Sun will appear to rise directly due east and set directly due west to someone standing on the equator. It means almost equal hours of darkness and light. In fact, the word equinox is derived from the Latin, meaning equus or equal, and nox, meaning night. It all comes about because Earth's rotational axis is tilted at an angle of about 23.4 degrees in relation to the ecliptic, the plane created by Earth's orbit around the Sun. That axial tilt's pointed to the same position in the sky regardless of Earth's orbital position around the Sun. So, on any other day of the year, either the northern or southern hemisphere will be tilted more towards the Sun. But on the two equinoxes, usually around March the 21st and September 23rd each year, the tilt of Earth's axis is directly perpendicular to the Sun's rays. However, there is a complication to all this called precession. Precession causes the Earth's spin axis to wobble ever so slightly, just like the axle of a spinning top. The rate of precession is only about half a degree per century, so people don't notice it on a human timescale. Because the direction of Earth's axis of rotation determines at which point in Earth's orbit the seasons occur, precession will cause a particular season, for example the Southern Hemisphere winter, to occur at a slightly different place from year to year over a 21,000 year cycle. At the same time, Earth's orbit's also subject to small changes called perturbations. Think of Earth's orbit as an ellipse, and there's a slow change in its orientation, which gradually shifts the point of perihelion, Earth's closest orbital position to the Sun. The two effects, the precession of the axis of rotation and the change in the orbit's orientation, work together to shift the seasons with respect to perihelion. Now, because we use a calendar year which is aligned to the occurrence of the seasons, the date of perihelion gradually regresses through a 21,000 year cycle, and we make minor adjustments to our calendar to keep in line with that. Now, if you're listening to us in Australia, there's also another complication you'd be aware of, and that is that for some strange reason, Australian seasons start on the first day of the month rather than on the solstices or equinoxes. So that means in Australia, autumn officially began on March the 1st. The March equinox is also the vernal equinox, the moment in time used to define the celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. And that's important, because in astronomy, the celestial coordinate system is the astronomer's answer to the latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates used for navigation on Earth's surface. It's used to specify the positions of objects in three-dimensional space and the direction of objects on the celestial sphere, the imaginary globe surrounding the Earth. In other words, it lets scientists determine the position of celestial objects, such as satellites, planets, stars, galaxies, and so on. Right ascension, which uses the symbol alpha, is the angular distance measured eastwards along the celestial equator from the vernal equinox. On the celestial sphere, it's analogous to terrestrial longitude. Declination, which uses the symbol delta, measures the angle north or south of the celestial equator. So it's the celestial equivalent to terrestrial latitude. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, and he joins us now for our tour of the March night skies. Well, this is not a bad time of the year for stargazing, actually, because it's uh, not too cold yet. The sun's going down earlier, so they've got longer nighttime hours. We're talking, you know, Southern Hemisphere here. We're coming into our winter, whereas, of course, up in the Northern Hemisphere, coming into your summer. So for us down here in the south, it's a, it's a good time of the year for stargazing. Some nice constellations and stars are up and uh, available to see. So starting in the south, everyone's favourite, the Southern Cross. It's about a third of the way up from the southern horizon at the moment in the sort of mid-evening hours and the cross itself is lying on its left-hand side. And I've mentioned this before that it doesn't look like a cross in the sense of a a plus sign on your calculator or something. It looks like a cross, um, like a crucifix or uh, or a kite. That's the sort of shape it's in. And it's quite small too. Crux or Crooks, C-R-U-X, that's its official name. So yeah, it's down there. And below it are the two pointers, the Alpha and Beta Centauri, yeah, quite nearby stars, of course. Now, if you're under dark skies, what you would see is the Milky Way running up from the sort of southern horizon through the cross and then sort of stretching nice overhead all the way up, heading into the northern part of the sky. And more or less overhead, not exactly near, next to each other, of course, but more or less overhead, 
Uh, you've got the two brighter stars in the sky, that's Sirius, and you've also got Canopus. Beautiful, beautiful, big, bright stars, uh, really light up the night. They're wonderful to see. And a bit north of them, if you sort of turn around and look to the north, you've got everyone's favourite constellation, which is Orion. We've spoken about Orion the Hunter many times on the show. Orion with his bright stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, and the three stars in a row, that's his belt, and the famous Orion Nebula sort of going off at an angle, which is in the part they call the sword hanging from his belt. This whole region looks great through a telescope. But even if you've only just got some binoculars, give it a go, you know. Um, Focus on this area, and there's fabulous stuff to see there. It's really tantalising with binoculars because you can just start to make things out. You can see some beautiful star clusters, and if you've got dark skies, you see a bit of nebulosity, and you think to yourself, gee, I wish I had a telescope. (laughs) That's what gets a lot of people hooked. Now, as far as the planets go, Jupiter is rising in the east at around about about 9.30 p.m. Eastern summertime still in Australia at the beginning of March, but by the end of the month, it's around about sunset, a couple of hours earlier, it's rising. You can't miss Jupiter. It's the biggest, brightest-looking thing in the eastern part of the sky during the evening. So it looks like a big, bright star, although, of course, it is a planet. And, of course, I say it's in the east during the evening, but as the Earth turns, if you're up early in the morning hours, then by the uh, sort of wee morning hours, Jupiter will then be over in the western half of the sky. Now, when it's still in the eastern half of the sky in the evening, take a look on March the 14th because the moon will be right next to it. It should look really, really quite specky, this big, bright planet with the moon nearby. Now, a few hours later in the evening, Saturn will rise above the eastern horizon. So you have to be out basically after midnight if you want to have a look at it. But please do so if you're out that time of night, if you're doing a bit of stargazing or you're getting home late or whatever. Particularly if you've got a telescope or someone you know has got a telescope and lets you have a look through. It looks really, really good with famous rings, of course. The other planets, well, Mercury's around the other side of the sun at the beginning of March, so we can't see it. It's in, lost in the sun's glare. A couple of weeks later, it'll just pop its head over the horizon in the west uh, after sunset, but it's going to be very low down and very hard to spot so I wouldn't even bother to be honest. Venus it can also be spotted low down on the western horizon at sunset but by the you've got to, got to be quick though because by the end of the first week of March it'll have pretty much moved too close to the sun to be seen uh, and then it'll be lost for view for a little while but it'll, don't worry it'll be back again next month in April and at this time it'll pop into the, uh, the sky above the eastern horizon before dawn and it's going to stay there sort of moving up and down a bit all the way through to November. So Venus is going to be big and bright and beautiful pretty much the whole year in the eastern sky before dawn. It's going to be really quite spectacular. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.